Uh, remarkably, some people are actually denying that there exists such a thing as a gender pay gap. Some right wing uh, people on the web or theorists claim it doesn't exist. But it's accepted by most statistical organisations that it's real. Uh, the, the UK government publishes comprehensive statistics on this, since all companies now have to register what pay they're giving their male and female employees, and what the difference between them is. So I looked at random at some of the larger companies in the UK government database here. Seven Sisters Food Group, women's mean hourly pay 15% lower. British Airways, mean hourly pay 35% lower. Greg's Bakeries, which has just become a very large company, um, mean hourly pay 21% lower. Alga Cookers, 17% lower. The striking thing, however, is that Northern Ireland has succeeded in reversing the gender pay gap. In Northern Ireland, women on average are paid more than men. Now, I think once we follow through the arguments, we'll see why it is that Northern Ireland has been able to achieve that. Now, if you look at the trend over time, on the, oops, go back again. On the left-hand side here, we've got pounds. And the bars show, in blue, men's median hourly pay, and in yellow, women's median hourly pay. And we can see that over the last six years, men's pay has been consistently higher. If you express it as a percentage, the gap has narrowed slightly, from about 10.5% to, to around 9%. And uh, even if the absolute gap remains the same, because both men and women's hourly pay has risen, the, this means the, the percentage gap has gone down. These are again from the UK government's database. If you take the USA, you see a similar trend. Men's pay throughout the period is higher than women's pay, median pay. These are hourly earnings. It's important to take hourly earnings because the average working week of the sexes differs. So just looking at hourly wage rates, the hourly rate for men remains higher than that of women. Though again, as in Britain, the gap is narrowing. Uh, this is over a much longer period. This is from 1979. To, to just before now. So the gap has narrowed over that period, but there is still an appreciable gap, so that on average in the United States, women are paid 86 cents for every dollar that a man is paid. So that's a gap of 14%, which is slightly greater than the gap in the UK. But there's another way of looking at this. Um, over time, the value of money changes. So if you just looked at it in terms of dollars, in current dollars, in the United States, both men and women appear to have been earning more over that period. And it looks like women's wages are catching up with men's. But you can do it another way around. You can see by how much the value added per hour by an average worker in the United States has risen. So the, the, value, the productivity in value per hour of the average worker in the United States in 1980 was about $10 an hour. It's now probably, this is a log scale, so it's now probably close to about 35 in 2010, um, probably 
probably 45 by now. Now, when you deflate these wages by the value that's being created per hour, and look at how many hours of their work, male and female workers are getting back, you see, in fact, both sexes have been experiencing declining wages. They've been declining wages in terms of the value they create. So, both men and women are worse off in terms of what they get back as a share of what they do. So what appears to be a narrowing of the wage gap, when you look behind it, is a narrowing for very specific reasons. I'm going to analyze this in more detail. If you work out the value created each hour, each year per hour in the USA, and then deflate the hourly earnings, or, or rather you deflate the weekly earnings by that, you get the number of hours that each worker gets back for doing a 40-hour week. And you see that they were getting back, men in 1979 were getting back 32 hours worth of their work back. By, 19, by 2017, it had dropped to 23 hours. Now, for women, it also declined, but it didn't decline as fast. It declined from 20 hours to 18.9. So it declined slowly. So the basic thing you've got to explain, firstly, why men's wages were higher than women's, why the gender pay gap has been declining, but why, in terms of the labor they do, both men and women are ending up with less over time. Now, when you're looking at this, you have to remember that it's taking place in a capitalist economy. It's taking place in an economy based on exploitation. People in the mainstream media see this in terms of are people being paid what they're worth? Are they being paid fairly for their contribution? But nobody gets paid fairly for their contribution. The huge inequalities of distribution you have in a capitalist society don't arise because people are being paid fairly by their, for their contributions. The 1% aren't doing 40% of the work in the society. They still get that amount of wealth. Now, we have to go and look at what Marx's theory of net wages were. The first point is that wages are not a payment for labor. They're not a payment for the work you do. If you do orthodox economics, wages are presented as if they're a payment for labor. According to Marx, they're not. Wages are the commodity cost of reproducing the ability to work, which is something quite different from labor itself. And they're regulated by the relative rates of accumulation of capital versus the supply of labor, what he calls the reserve army of labor. It's not a matter of people being paid what they're worth, it's a matter of how low can for wages be forced by competition with the unemployed. Now, since labor can be reproduced in fewer hours than the whole working day, there is a surplus available for the property owning classes, for the elites. And this surplus value arises from that and is the source of profit, interest, and rent. If we look at a working day there, this is, these figures are not unrealistic. Uh, say someone started work at nine, and they work through the day. By one o'clock, they've done enough work to pay for their own wages. 
If they go on working till five, that's four hours of work they've done for nothing for their employer. If the employer can extend the working day to six hours, till six o'clock, then that's an extra hour's value that goes to the employer. The key point is that nobody is being paid the value of their labor. And the call you get for people to be paid the value of their labor is based on an illusion. You never pay the value of their labor. All you're ever paid is the ability to, the cost of reproducing your ability to work. And that cost of reproducing your ability to work breaks down into three components. Cost of feeding people, feeding and clothing people, the cost of training people, and the cost of raising the next generation of workers. These are the reproduction costs of labor, of labor power, the ability to work. Now, if we step back behind Marx to Ricardo and Malthus, to what Marx was building on, which is the classical iron law of wages. And this theory said that basically there was an equilibrium process, albeit a slow one. Ricardo argued that if wages rise, more people are reproduced. People have bigger families and there's a lower infant mortality. This results in more competition for work, wages fall, you get higher infant mortality, and the population stabilizes. So wages, he said, would stay near a subsistence minimum. Now, is this theory correct? Uh, provided you keep the time scale long, yes, the theory is correct. What I've plotted there are English agricultural wages on the top line and the population of England on the bottom line. Now I've expressed them as an index. They're both expressed such that 1860 is 100%. Okay? So 18, the population is expressed as a percentage of the population in 1860 and wages are expressed as a percentage of the population in 1860, and it's in a log scale. Now, what do you see? The first striking feature about that is the occurrence of the Black Death in the mid-1300s. Huge reduction in the population immediately. Immediately after the Black Death, wages shoot up because of shortage of labor power. After the Black Death, you've got a series of plagues occurring at intervals, which continued to force the population down until after 1500. Then the, pop the, the population acquired resistance to the plague and it started to grow again. Once the population started to grow again, Wage levels started to fall. Wages peaked in the 14, around 1460. They then started falling whilst population rose. Then you get the Great Plague of 1866, sorry, 1666. Population is pushed down again, or population growth stops, and wages start to rise again. After that, population growth resumes and wages start to fall. Now, that is around 1800 is when Ricardo and Malthus are writing. And that is the background to their theory. The history up to that point seems to bear it out. Now, I have put a data point for 1860 there, which of course Ricardo and Malthus didn't know. Let's have a look at that. Just wages in 1860 
after Britain had been industrializing for perhaps 80 years, were still lower than they had been in 1460. They hadn't British wages didn't recover their 15th century peak until the 1870s. Now that demonstrates just how important a shortage of labor power is to real living standards. Huge increase in productivity during the 18th and 19th centuries. Huge increase in what workers are producing. But until 1870, they were worse off than they had been in the 1400s. But the relationship between population and wages is breaking down once we reach the middle of the 19th century. Since the population has shot up, according to Malthus's theory, wages should have gone right down. And this is why Marx is critical of Malthus's theory. Because he could see, right in the, in the 1860s, that wages were not falling the way they should be. They were still bloody low, but they were not actually falling. And why was that? key difference is Canada. The availability of the prairies, the availability of more land to grow grain. What I've got here is the first graph, the dotted line, shows the urban or working class population, non-agricultural working class of Britain, in, in absolute numbers here. I've got a uh, graph which is, I've tried to translate into person equivalents of grain, the amount of grain a person might eat, okay? And I've probably underestimated the amount of grain that a person would eat because I've taken the number of calories you'd eat if you're a sedentary person. If you're doing heavy labor, it would be more. But, the point is that from the 1850s, Britain was importing enough grain to support its urban population at least. And the downward pressure on wages, the malnutrition, which Ricardo and Malthus were predicting, didn't occur. And it didn't occur because of something they, they didn't foresee, which is open. Oh, the opening up of the new world to food supplies. Then in the 20th century, artificial fertilizers further increased. Something which people underestimate in the, when they think about imperialism was the drive to obtain food. The drive to obtain food from rapidly growing urban populations in Europe. When we hear of German imperialism wanting living room. Why did they want Lebensraum? They wanted it because British imperialism had got Canada, got Australia, could provide the crops from Canada to Australia to support a growing population, and could ship out a significant part of its population to Canada and Australia. If you look at the statistics, again, it appears the German population was above the British population. But that was because a large part of the British population was then living in Canada and Australia. The drive of German imperialism was to acquire similar land to overcome the population pressure that was affecting Germany as a industrialized. Now, all that disappears. All that disappears after 1945. All this drive to acquire settler colonies suddenly goes away. Now, on one hand, we know that the Germans were defeated. Their attempt to turn Russia into a plantation economy for Germany was defeated by the Russian army. But 
as a drive for imperialism. They don't disappear. Why did it disappear? It disappeared because of the power process. It disappeared because of the ability to produce synthetic fertilizer. And secondly, the fact that if you have tractors, you don't have to set aside a large area of your land to feed horses. You don't have to grow barley to feed horses. You can grow the entire crop to feed humans. Or if you grow the crop to feed cattle, which humans eat. So you can see it's actually a change in the productive forces. It removes the drive, which existed until the 1930s, for second colonialism. Now, the problem with that theory, the theory that Malthus had, is it's a very slow feedback mechanism. It's right on the scale of centuries. But why should employers worry about the next generation? Why should they be worried about whether wages are enough to, make, to support the rising generation? So the Malthusian mechanism operates over centuries, but it doesn't explain the short-term movements of wages. Now, I think you can explain them still using the reproduction theory if you start looking at more sophisticated statistical model of what happens with actual wages. Uh, have you heard of Mandelbrot who invented the Mandelbrot set? knows about the Mandelbrot set? Okay, sorry, if I, I'm a computer scientist. If I said this in a computer science lecture, everyone, all the students would know what the Mandelbrot set. It's this pattern here. You must have seen this pattern in the graphics before. Okay, he's a, he, the, he's a mathematician who became famous for that. But well before that, he'd studied the laws of wages. And he had shown that there is a mathematical law or functional form that the probability distribution of wages follows. And it's a log normal distribution. Okay? Now, what a log normal distribution is, is if you plot it on a log scale, it looks like a normal distribution. But when you expand it out, it's a distribution with a long right tail. So there's a disproportionate number of people who are paid a lot compared, sorry, there are people who are paid disproportionately large amounts <coughs> compared to the people on the, the left-hand side of the distribution. Now, it's another matter why it takes this functional form, but let's just assume it does take this functional form. And it's one of the, the features of Modern Marxist economics is that it's able to deduce a lot from simple functional forms. Simple laws of statistics are able to deduce a lot. So let's take the fact that that's the, the functional form of the wage distribution. And then let's try putting a couple of lines. We know that it's not actually feasible to have a wage where the bottom end of the distribution is so low that a single person on that wage would starve. That doesn't require a response time of centuries. That requires a response time of a few weeks. Now, it's not to say that the bourgeoisie don't at times choose to impose such low wages. Have you heard of Lytton Strachey? He was Viceroy of India in the 1860s, 1870s. And during a time of famine there, following the liberal doctrines that it would undermine the incentive to work if they paid poor relief in India, he said the uh, scheme that they would famine relief would only be provided by people if people worked on roads. And the calorific value 
of the wage that Lytton Strachey paid workers who worked on, on public projects was actually lower than what the Germans gave in Belsen. And of course, large numbers of these workers starved to death. Now, he was a Malthusian, so he thought it was a good thing if he could starve people to death. And I give the example of Belsen. Again, German capitalists followed the same policy in the 1940s when they had false labor available to them. All that mattered is they could keep them working for long enough to meet the war requirements. But that's not a, a stable situation, even for a year or two. So, in practice, there is a lower limit to the wage, which is why the wage distribution has this form. It can't have a normal distribution, because a normal distribution would give you a great tail going out here. It would give you a tail of the same length on each side. And it would mean it would actually be people with a negative wage. People were having to pay to have work. So you can see just on simple reasoning that the wage distribution cannot have a normal distribution form. It can have a logarithm form. There will be another level which is the starvation wage for a family with only one earner. Nobody who is supporting a family is going to work for a wage which will only support one person. So that gives us two constraints on the function. Now, in fact, any of these types of functions. They're gamma functions. With two numbers, you can deduce the whole shape of the function. Log normal function like that, if you know the lower limit of it set by the starvation wage, and you know the starvation wage for an average size family, and you know the percentage of families that have that, uh, have one earner, you can deduce what the shape of the whole distribution will be. Now, I'm not going to try and uh, work that out, but I'm just showing people think starvation and food, or well, that's just maybe real to talk about India. Is it relevant for a country like the USA? Yes, it is. This is US Food and Agriculture Organization statistics. Um, this shows the percentage of households that are food insecure. It rose from 11% in 1995 to 14% in 2014. Households who are very food insecure also rose. They have two different thresholds of how many, how often people go hungry a week to see whether they are food insecure or very food insecure. How much of the week is someone going hungry? But the important point is there is a proportion of the population in a country which is extremely rich agriculturally who are going hungry. 48 million people in the USA are food insecure. People on that grade, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization, could not survive unless they were receiving federal food aid or charitable relief. So we used to be told, when I studied economics in the 1970s, that the idea of a subsistence wage and a subsistence minimum was old 19th century theory had no relevance to the modern world. Well, it does have a relevance to the modern world. It has increasing relevance to the modern world. Increasing percentages of people are going hungry. Increasing percentages of people can barely survive. Now let's look at how I worked out some of those other things. And you can do this yourself, okay? I strongly advise you, 
You want to understand how capitalism works. Go and look at government statistics from different countries. Go and start doing some calculations yourself. They're not difficult to do. You can start out doing them just with a pocket calculator. That's how I started out doing analysis. I borrowed another student's pocket calculator since I didn't have one myself. Now, you can work out how many hours were worked in the USA in 2017. And how much is that? It's 204 billion hours, roughly, work were done. And you can see the total value produced by the business sector of the US economy. I'm not ta taking government employees into account. This is non-farm business sector. Those are the total hours worked in the non-farm business sector. And the median hourly wage in the US was $18.20. If you divide the total value produced by the total number of hours that were worked, you can get what Marxist economists call the monetary equivalent of labor time. Marx says that value is created by labor. But you can actually go and work out how much value is created by an hour's labor. In the USA, in 2017, it was $40. Now that sounds a lot, because you know how little people are paid. And even $18, compared to wages, a lot of wages paid here, $18 sounds good. But that means the median worker in the US was getting paid 26 minutes of the hour. Now, this reproduction price has to cover food, clothes, heat, transport, housing that workers have to buy in the open market to survive. Since it's a market price, it only matches the commodities board. It doesn't match any non-market goods and services that people have. There are things which are excluded from the value of labor power, the reproduction of cost of labor. The air we breathe is for free. The warmth of the sun in the summer is for free. The joys of spring are for free. Now, these are all use values which we depend on and are essential to us. But they're not commodities, so they don't get enter into it. If you grow food in your garden, or you have a small plot, that's not included. If you get free education and health care in certain countries, that then doesn't get included. Obviously, in the United States, where you pay for these things, it does get included. Also, domestic labor of co cooking and child care doesn't count because it's non-commodities. Now, that may appear to be unfair that certain things are only paid for because they take commodity form. But when you think about the social relations of capitalism, you can see this is an inevitable effect of capitalist social relations. You can't wish it away. Why this? It's because the money that a working class household gets all goes out on the purchase of market services. If they were paid more than that, they would be accumulating capital and would move out of the working class. So it is a basic feature of capitalist society that the wage all gets spent. So the total wage has to equal total market uh, purchases. If workers are in the situation that they're saving, then the price of labor power has risen the bucket's value. If they can only survive on state benefits, then the wage has fallen below its value. The the implication of this is that the price of labor can act, or labor power can deviate significantly from the total labor needed to reproduce labor power. 
key examples of that. Housework is labour that's necessary to reproduce labour power. But it doesn't get a monetary form, because the monetary form only covers the things that the household buys in. If you take the migrant labour system in South Africa, that had a high rate of exploitation because they could count on domestic food, food being produced on small plots for the workers and for the next generation being entirely supported on those plots. Their food coming from those. Uh, alternatively, if you look at someone like the USSR, you see that the wage significantly underestimates the value of labor power because so many goods were free. Food was subsidized, heating was practically free, housing was practically free, public transport was at uh, ridiculously low prices. Now, let, let's look at Victorian capitalism. Before the laws against child labour were introduced, the necessary purchases to support the family were made out of the earnings of the parents and the earnings of the children. And parents tried to get their children out into the factories as soon as they could because they depended on the, the revenue that came from the children to feed them. In the case of modern capitalism, you have necessary purchases are made up out of the earnings of the man in the household and the earnings of the woman in the household. No earnings from the children. So what was the effect of prohibition of child labour is that it raised adult wages. Adult wages now had to be enough to support children once they went to school and weren't being sent out to the, to the mills. So not only was the prohibition of child labour advantageous to the working class from the standpoint that their children were no longer having to work in the mills and they were getting a chance to be educated, but it had the side effect of raising adult wages. The mill owners could no longer use cheap child labour to undercut adult wages. Now, if we look at that formula I had before, the necessary purchases are going to be made out of the male hourly wage times the male working hours plus the female hourly wage times the female working hours. And if we take a mean unisex wage, The total household wage hours multiplied by the, the unisex wage. If the total household wage hours goes up, the mean unisex wage will fall. If the total hourly wages go down, wage hours goes down, the hourly wage will rise. There is an inverse relationship between working hours and wages. So the reduction of the working compulsory reduction of the working day, which was introduced by factory acts in the 19th century, had the effect of raising wages. Now, as the female share of the workforce gets closer to 50%, this theory predicts a gap, gender pay gap will now. As the total labor supply supplied by a family goes up, the average unisex wage will fall. And as labor productivity rises, the labor equivalent of the family wage will fall. Now, all these things you can see happening in modern capitalism. Take Canada. Again, same sort of graph as you see from the US. It appears that the... Um, women's wages are catching up. Men's wages are, are 
more or less static, apart from they got a, a wee peak just before the, the recession hit. Look at the participation rates. As the male participation rate falls and the female participation rate rises, the gender pay gap declines because the pay of, the t of an average family with two people working has to be sufficient to support the next generation. And Northern Ireland is, is the clincher to this argument. Northern Ireland shows that 51% of all, job, all, all employees in Northern Ireland are female. And it's the only part of Britain where female earnings, hourly earnings, are higher than male hourly earnings. Um, I, these are backup figures for the United States. Same kind of, these are the participation rates. Falling male participation rate, rising female participation rate, and narrowing gender pay gap. If we express the, um, the this is the data I showed before, earnings in hours. These are the participation rates, and this is the family income in hours. How many hours of labour value was the family getting? You can see the family income was full. It fell as the total number of hours delivered to capital rose. So, men's earnings in hours went down, female earning in hours went down, family income in hours went down. Liberal accounts of the capitalist system claim that capitalism is bringing progress, women's employment prospects are improving, the gap between men and women's play is narrowing. Well, those things are true at one level, but there's another side to them. This is happening at the same time as there is increased exploitation. And the real value of women's pay is falling and the only reason that the gender pay gap is closing is that male wages are falling faster than female wages are in real terms. Now, let's contrast that with the communist idea. It abolishes gender pay because it abolishes the wage system. It abolishes the system of people being paid for the cost of reproducing their labor power. Marx's scheme was that people, everyone who works one hour is credited one hour of labor, whether they're male or female. It's one hour of your life. You're credited an hour's labor. If you translate that into what it would purchase in a monetary economy, it would be equivalent to men and women in the United States. One labor credit would buy them as much as $40 does now. I mean, if you ask anyone, apart from top 5% of the population, which system are you going to be better off in? Whether you're male or female, which system are you going to be better off in? It's clear. That's it.